Hi, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me in this uh, online interview. It's a kind of uh, a perfect image on, on the on the last year. Huh? Yeah, sums it up pretty well. I remember speaking to you. It was a, probably one year ago when uh, when you had to uh, to stand and watch out of your window in Sluseholm and you could see some guys running around. How how has the last year been uh, for you? Uh, I think uh, uh, okay, challenging um, initially. Uh, I think it was good for us actually. Um, people in my position anyway, it made us think differently about training, made us become more inventive, um, creative, think outside the box. Uh, I think when you find success um, with specific routines, you sort of keep working in the same way, uh, which which is okay, but can also be quite limiting. Uh, so I think it was, it was good for people in my position to be uh, challenged in a unpredictable and unforeseen way mm. i think uh we all benefited uh, many of us in the long run from it but uh now we're sitting here today because uh very soon actually you will uh you'll say f- farewell to to Brumby after 10 years in the club yeah. yeah um can you tell us a bit about why you're leaving what is this new possibility that you got uh, back home Uh, three weeks ago, I was contacted by an MLS club. Four weeks ago, maybe, um, uh, and they offered me the position of uh, head of performance in sports science. Um, and it uh, it wasn't exactly in the plans um, on any level, but it seemed like uh, the right opportunity for my myself professionally uh, at this time and. Um, good opportunity for the family as well so something uh after a lot of discussion and, uh thoughts back and forth we we decided to, uh, to to accept the offer and it's in your hometown right uh it's it's not entirely in my hometown but it's where i moved mm. to to denmark from um i was at the university of colorado in boulder And uh, the club is is located very closely to there. Um, do you have family there? Sister, brother-in-law, nieces, um, and parents also buying a winter house there as well. So um, we'll uh, we'll talk more about this uh, later. But first of all, I want to go those ten mm-hmm. years back when you move when you made the move to uh, to Denmark. Because uh, it's it's actually a, a quite a funny story uh, how you ended up spending 10 years in in Brumby. Can you take us back uh, to where it yeah. all began? Uh, yeah, I was at the the university, and um, most of the MLS clubs would would not take my emails or calls. I just wanted to to intern with them uh, very much with the one that just hired me, <laughs> um, and uh, have. Uh, Extended family here in Denmark, and they lived in uh, Allerholt, just north of the city. And said, um, "If you want to pop up uh, for six months, you know, come overseas. Maybe you can intern for one of the many clubs in the Copenhagen area." And um, so, got on the plane with a, a suitcase and a smile. Uh, I think I sent 214 emails before I arrived, and then another hundred something. After I got here, because I I still didn't have any any offers or any acceptance. Um, the three clubs I did hear back from was Wonby, Copenhagen, and Norsla. And uh, nobody really had an internship, or they weren't really working in that way uh, at the time. I wasn't searching for money; just the uh, sort of real world applicable uh, experience. And then uh, someone contacted me and said the The women's team actually uh, in Bonbury is looking for uh, a fitness coach to be there almost every day. And it's a, it's a good team, a lot of national players. Uh, 
they're in second place, they were in Champions League, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, went to a meeting with uh, Per Listo and did a couple of trainings with the girls and then uh, was fortunate enough to, to be with them for the entire first year. And uh, then they brought me back. Um, speaking about the women's team, because uh, a few days ago they they uh, they played against Lyon um, in the in the Champions League. Do you think these you know, work working close with them? I know not the same players uh, that they are now, but do you think they get recognized enough for for the the thing they do? Um, playing football on a high level, having a job, uh, etc. Uh, I think they get recognized um, socially uh, for what they do. I think uh, a lot of, especially uh, young girls and women, are really aware of the accomplishments of a lot of the the women's teams uh, and what they've done in, in Denmark. Um, economically, it's a it's a different story. Um, yeah, I would say they're not not as recognized uh, as they should be, especially if they want the sport. To, to grow uh, within Denmark. Um, and uh, I think certainly the aspect that is not seen or appreciated enough at all is uh, what the what the women accomplish uh, outside of football. Mm. You know, I had a player who's now a doctor and was in medical school when she was playing full time. Uh, another who was a nurse, a number who were teachers, a number who were university students, uh, and they still trained every day and were at the club, and worked hard and traveled weekends, and, uh, sacrificed as, as much or more um, as uh, many of the men that I've come across. Uh, so that I was, uh, that really impressed me what they were capable of. But after uh, spending some time at the women's team, you got pulled over in uh, at the Superliga team as an assistant, or what? Yeah, but not until Copenhagen wanted to hire me for the School of Excellence, <gasps> and then and then the men's team popped over. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was um, yeah, I was just in the right place, right time. Um, uh, the previous fitness coach's contract was running out. He wanted to explore some other things. Uh, so they offered me a job to come on as uh, his assistant mm. for the first six months and continue to work with the women's team. So it was, uh, it was an absolutely perfect situation. It was, uh, albeit a little bit unexpected. I was actually expecting more to maybe be brought on with, uh, with the youth department, U19, U17, these kind of things. Uh, so I was really surprised uh, when I got the initial offer and, uh, of course, uh, accepted that. And stayed on with the women's team for an additional two years mm. after that. Uh, so I I know that at this time when you got the offer from FC Copenhagen, you haven't been in Brøndby for that long. Um, but especially in the recent years, we've seen many moves back and forth, uh, Brøndby and and uh, and FC Co. In the position you are now, Aaron, could you make the move? Is it different? Uh, in your role and other roles than a, a player, for example? Uh, I think it's different for foreigners uh, mm. than it is for Danes um, because they understand the history. And as a foreigner, it's often um, you're you're happy to have employment. You're happy to have the job. Uh, you're happy for the opportunity, I think. Uh, You know, with some of the young guys that we've brought up, fond of uh, Jovo mm. Lindstrom, uh, Kabongo, Skipper, all these guys, I think that would be um, unthinkable for them. Uh, but uh, it seems to be a growing trend uh, in sports. Um, you see it happen at levels of Man City and Man U. Um, it's, uh, I won't be too critical of any situation because we now benefit uh, from having a, a former Copenhagen guy in, uh, in Hannes mm. uh, and, I'm, and I'm grateful that he's uh, come over to uh, to fill the gap uh, when I'm away. But could you do it now, tomorrow? Uh, 
it wasn't my ambition. Uh, it's, it, you know, um, if I left one B, I was, I was going to leave, leave Denmark. Mm. You know, that's the, I think that was, uh, you, I mean, if you're at one of the two, you're at the top, uh, along with, you know, Midgelin, perhaps notion of what is Danish football. Um, so I think, uh, it wasn't something that I overly considered. Um, but I won't lie. I mean, if I got sacked and I needed a job, well, you have a family, you have to support them. Um, then of course, uh, family in, in those situations would, would always take priority. Mm. But 10 years in, uh, in Brøndby, um, must have made some impact, uh, on you. You're like the only consistent person. Uh, that actually has been in the club all the time. I have covered uh, Brunby, for example. Um, how much has the club grown into you? Uh, significantly. I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> it's been a huge part of my life. It's had a huge, huge influence, not on, only on the day to day, but uh, it sort of shaped me um, in terms of who I am as a coach. Uh, what I was able to explore and the directions I wanted to go and um, type of place where you can make mistakes, learn from them and become better as a result. There's, uh, there's a lot of places um, at certain levels where you just don't have that kind of freedom, which is unfortunate because then people end up working to uh, survive and keep a job instead of progressing become better uh, and if you're just working to survive ultimately you will be sacked anyways mm. uh, because a part of making people better is to to work with an element of risk um, and I was certainly provided with that that freedom and encouragement at the club so it's it's definitely shaped me a lot and also you you grew into a bigger and bigger role um, can can you take us uh, through that? from being an assistant at the Superliga team and what happened from there? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I, the way I describe it is I climbed aboard a sinking ship. <laughs> We were, mm-hmm. I didn't know, uh, I didn't, I didn't give a shit. I was just so happy to have the opportunity and the job that was completely irrelevant to me. Um, it was a dream opportunity, um, but I came on in a difficult time and uh, the guy ahead of me was, was removed um, I think in August, September, something like this. And, uh, and I was brought on in, in the, the head position. And uh, to be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, <laughs> I was totally inexperienced. I was totally young. Uh, I had all these theoretical sort of book research ideas, which is what you're educated with at um a university and uh fortunately i was just surrounded by uh really clever people especially pete uh, the head physio who's still there mm. um and we just sort of talked through a lot of stuff and uh how we came on and um you know started to get a hang of what was going on the periodization um, you know what kind of stimulus uh, the players could handle and when Uh, and then we survived in Horsens. Um, and then after that, everything sort of changed. The whole structure of the club, the board, the direction, the coaching, everything. Uh, then we entered the Thomas Frank era, which was full of optimism and progression. And a lot of young guys and a lot of energy. Uh, of course, Daniel coming back, Calumbert, those guys. Um, and that was a possession style of football. And I was fortunate enough to work with Albert Capellas, mm. who taught me more about football than I think, uh, anyone else without a doubt, uh, in my tenure. Um, also because it was the first time that I was actually capable of doing my job and learning about football. Uh, previously I just really had to fight and focus on, on my tasks. Um, And then enter the Zonega era. And then you uh, became a star. Yeah, another, well, I, I think our, uh, 
the, what he wanted to do with the players and the way I wanted to work really, really aligned. Mm. Um, uh, he really wanted to push. I really wanted to push. Um, it was two guys who had their foot on the gas and we were a bit without a handbrake. Um, unfortunately, we just had the absolute right group of guys. Um, some really good young athletes, um, some really ambitious guys that were just able to uh, deal with both of our craziness uh, in combination. And uh, they put together something really nice. That was a, a really fun period. Um, that was another time. Uh, I think after working with, with Alberts and then the combination of Alex, that's when I could sort of put everything together. Um, and those two, those two periods really defined uh, who I am today. What would you say are your biggest experiences, if you can uh, point out one or two experiences? biggest experiences in terms of a specific game or your your choose uh, your choice mm. it can be a personal thing it can be a game it could be uh, some player you worked with uh, whatever uh, difficult difficult of course it's yeah of course um imagine horsens two two draw of course uh enters your head Uh, in a in an incredibly negative situation, um, it's, it's a feeling that doesn't leave you. Uh, I've still never seen one minute of that game. I've never seen the goals in replay. I've never. I don't watch it. Um, makes you a bit sick. Sometimes when you think about it, it can be a good thing to think about if you're training. Mm -hmm. uh, it can help you find a new level. It's a bad thing to think about uh, if you're trying to sleep at night yeah. because of the, the situations that run through your head and the way it replays. So as bad as that situation was, uh, you, you learn from it. You emerge better in one way or another. Uh, certainly some of our players did. Uh, without a doubt, it didn't kill them, and uh, it didn't kill anybody else. Um, so it takes it takes difficult things to to make you better, uh, and that was certainly one of them. Uh, if you can overcome that, you can overcome just about anything in your career. Mm. Uh, that's a definitive one. Um, the other one. Uh, One of the favorite experiences with ha was uh, Hatta home. Mm -hmm. Three one, Timu Puki ringing up three. Um, that was just a good combination of new excitement in the club, uh, big energy, new way of playing, fun way of training, uh, shit fun to watch, um, and then all culminating. Uh, Beating a really, really good German side uh, at home in front of uh, incredibly enthusiastic fans. Um, that was uh, that was a good win. That was a definitive moment. Um, I would say Horsens away when we survived, but I was too young, too naive to really understand the gravity of mm. what the game really really meant. Um, I didn't. You know, it was my first year. I was still trying to figure out the structuring and relegation. There's no relegation in American sports, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I seem to be the least phased by it. Yeah. Um, uh, and also not knowing and understanding uh, what the club meant to so many people and understanding the club's history. So I didn't, it was some years before I really understood that. Um, Looking back, that should be my favorite game ever. Um, uh, first cup final against Copenhagen. Mm. Uh, shit result, shit result, but we smashed them. Uh, we were the better side. Um, I remember just walking into the stadium. 
the yellow wall. It was, uh, I realized I was crying, even though I, you know, I was just happy, but it was just, it was so emotional. Um, it was so, the noise. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's situations like that to justify you being away from your best friends, your parents, your siblings. Uh, yeah, missing your best, some best friends' weddings, uh, maybe a best friend's parents' funeral. I mean, there's a lot of things you sacrifice in football to live, uh, when you live on the other side of the planet. Um, but situations like that, those moments, you understand why you do it. Mm. Um, can you, can you point out, um, a player, maybe two, um, who really impressed you in their physical development um, during the time working with you? Uh, if I could mention one example, it would, it would be Mikael Ure. Uh, mm. But maybe you can point out some one or two players where you were really impressed. Yeah. Um... Yeah, uh, I think I think yeah, U is a good example, but he's just I think he's where he should be, mm. you know. And not to take away from him, he he definitely got there with uh, with hard work, um, a lot of hard work and a lot of hard work that he did on his own and his own initiative. Um, but he's he's got that engine, he's got that power. So I'm happy that he's, he's brought that forward. Uh, top of my head, Fondo, without a doubt. He mm. arrived as a skinny, hardworking 16-year-old who wasn't afraid to hit the biggest guy uh, in any training match or any any friendly or, or even sometimes in our own training. Um, you know, now he's bigger, stronger. He's still got that big running engine. plays 10 kilos heavier than he is mm. you know um it's like rudolph austin but you know is as little as label yeah. um you know but again he's he's really developed in a nice way great mentality really good work ethic um i think uh andrew you there mm. You know, he he always had some gifts, but uh, under Zonaga's system, uh, paired with my idiot run, and uh, in the preseason and our, our the combination of two crazies, uh, he really really grew and flourished. He was always a good athlete, but man, he was a he was a killer uh, in that system and that training model. And, uh, It was really fun to watch him because, of course, we had him since he was a young guy. You know, mm. Sometimes it just takes the right combination of things to really uh, unlock somebody. Yeah. See the potential. Can you also try and describe the um, the the whole um, development of uh, data and uh, technical things at uh, your service? Because that's something Brunby invested a lot in during the last uh, few years and how that helped uh, your work yeah i think it's it's become more and more common in all sport um extremely so in football uh which is actually a pretty complicated place to to apply it mm. it's quite it's been common for a long time in sports like baseball basket uh, american football which is an easy place to apply it because there's a definitive beginning and an end to to each series or or each play. Uh, football is actually uh, quite a difficult place because it's 22 guys spread out over a big area. Human beings have a lot of variability and are unpredictable. Yeah. So it's it's been creeping into football for the last decade. Um, And I think now there there starts to be uh, quite a bit of clarity in the in the ways that that we can use it best and what we should focus on in terms of high intense meters, 
uh, sprinting meters, number of sprints. Um, it's certainly a good indicator just to let you know that the guys are performing um, in their best possible way. It's a good indicator to to inform you if uh, a guy's having trouble performing, uh, which is, uh, in my experience, quite often an indicator of overtraining or fatigue. Um, you know, very rarely in, in one beer, our situation is, is it a guy who underperforms or doesn't put forth the work because uh, he doesn't want to. That's, that's not the group of guys we have. So I think for us, it's been, um, it's been good in terms of giving the guys the rest when they need it and also um, letting us know if a guy's a little overexposed and maybe needs a little bit of rest. Uh, but each club uses it in their own way. Mm. You know, okay. um, but um, I think I'm pretty pretty satisfied that we we have the technology. We use it um, as a tool to assist us. But people in our department, we don't. Uh, myself, Morton, uh, Pete, uh, two physios now on us as well. My assistant, Mass. Um, we really focus on seeing the human beings. Use our experience, use our eyes, have conversations with the guys, um, allow them to communicate with us, and it's our job to to seek them out as well, so that we have a complete understanding of what's going on. And uh, we use the data as um, just confirmation to to ensure that uh, the you know our assumptions, our beliefs, mm. the direction of our conversation. Uh, we use that to ensure that that is in fact what's happening, and, and quite often the, the data will reflect the, the conversations. Okay. But we really believe that personal interaction, um, close relationships, trust, um, having our hands on the players—that is the the best way to effectively train. And the data and all of the technology is a, a nice tool to, to aid all of that. Okay, and um, that kind of leads to my next uh, question because I know now uh, Anna Storsko uh, has come in as a co- consultant for for the rest of the the season. Um, but are you helping Brunby pointing out your successor because 10 years of of knowledge and know how or how do you make sure that that some of this also stays in the club? If you understand what I mean. Uh, well, I, the most important thing is that Pete is there. Mm. Uh, I've worked with Pete this entire time period, and uh, we Morton for most of it as well, uh, almost all of it. We don't take a lot of decisions without consulting each other. Uh, we have long, detailed meetings uh, regarding the players um, at various points of the year, uh, as well as the day to day. They have copies of all of my preseasons, uh, the guys' weight programs, um, and uh, you know. But Pete's going to be the go-to guy in that stuff because, um, as much as myself, he's been as just as important as influencing the culture uh, in the way we work, the way we want to train, how hard we want to train, the amount we want to train. Um, we're happy to train more than just about every club. Uh, every preseason, um, and we're happy with the results that we get, not only in terms of game data, but also uh, lack of injuries. So uh, Pete will Pete will carry the torch, without a doubt. And if the club wants any assistance in terms of finding the next guy or moving forward, I'm happy to assist uh, for years to come. I will uh, move on to some of the questions that I got from the from the readers, and the first one is from uh, Carsten. Um, he uh, he says that he sometimes uh, have passed you uh, running around Westwalden, and he wants to know what your time is uh, per kilometer and what your best uh, time for 10 kilometers is. <laughs> Uh, per K changes every day. Depends upon how the body's feeling. I'm 38, so 
I have to accept getting slower. Uh, yeah, best 10K is sub 30. I don't know. That's not really a fixed distance that we run that often in the U.S. Um, I truly run for, uh, for pleasure and enjoyment generally. So I let the wind blow me. Um, and then uh, Espen, he asks, how many rounds have you run in uh, Brøndbyskoven? Me? Mm. Countless. I was trying to think about that the other day. Uh, I would say hundreds of 800s and close to a thousand full laps. Then we have uh, Tobias Holmberg. He asks you, uh, what uh, what have you learned the most from living in Denmark, and what will you uh, what will you take home? Uh, very simply, um, what it is to pay tax, and and uh, I, I realize people complain about it, and me going back to the U.S. now, wow, I'm going to benefit from that. Um, But it's just, it's shocking. Um, I mean, the amount of things that you get here as a citizen, regardless of of how much you earn, free education, SU. Um, We had our, Maria and I had our first child here. Um, uh, The healthcare surrounding uh, our son, Luca, from the midwife to the hospital, any follow-up appointments to I was taking him to the ER a couple of weeks ago when he almost cut his finger off. Um, it's it just works, you know. Um, and I will that will forever have an impact on me and the way I vote in the United States, um, mm. and uh, also just what it is to 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 truly feel like you have that you are a part of something. I feel like I've been more a part of uh, Denmark. Uh, as a contributor um, and as a beneficiary of it, than I ever felt like I was a part of America. And then a little bit back to uh, to your work in Brøndby, Christian Brobeck, he asks, what principles from your training philosophy do you hope uh, will get um, uh, will stay in in Brøndby after you leave? Running without the ball. In the preseason, without mm-hmm. a doubt, and running without the ball in the right way, with the right progression, with the right build-up to lead in. Um, we train a lot more than a lot of other clubs. Um, we we do that because we're we're also a developing club, but we are ambitious. We and it's difficult, you know. We want to win uh, every single Sunday, regardless of where we're playing. Uh, we expect to perform every single time, but included in that, we also expect that the guys want to develop and we challenge them to do that. Um, I think the the running without the ball just creates this career long, not just season long, but career long foundation because these guys really, really learn what they're capable of and really see how far see how far they can go uh, than they previously thought. And I think they really benefit not only in the season in terms of performance, but also injury prevention uh, and and mentality. I mean, it's challenging like shit. It's hard. They're heavy. Uh, and every new guy that comes goes, wow, this asshole's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but by the end of the preseason, they go, wow, I can't believe I just did that. Um, and after that point, stronger, more robust, better athlete emerges. So I really, I truly hope that that is uh, something that I can leave with the club. Um, the the last question I will take here is from uh, Patrick Andersen. He asked, what uh, player have, has, ha, have had the biggest influence on your own development uh, as a human being? Oh man, uh, there's quite a few. Um, I think to work with guys like Kella and Aga, um, guys who are abroad at big clubs, um, 
and then to come back to Bonbury. Um, you know, when they let you know that you have quality uh, and that uh, when they come to you for advice, when they, when they seek you out, um, that, is, that is empowering when you're, when you're quite young. I wasn't that deep into my career at that point. Uh, of course, those guys have had a plethora of experience. Uh, so that was a big, big impact for me. Um, and then there's other guys, you know, um, uh, a guy like Tony Young, who previously in my career, I would think, oh, uh, look at this guy's data from training in the match. Look how he's not moving. You know, but then you learn what it is to be an incredibly talented, clever football player, one who uh, anticipates instead of reacts, you know, um, and then you, a good reminder, don't always look at the numbers, but actually see the athletes, see the game. Um, you know, it's not always about, in my department, we we can focus a lot on test scores, data, those things. But with Tony, there's a reminder that there's just so much variation in what the term quality can refer to. Then I have uh, the the last one is not a question. It's actually a message from um, a guy called Benjamin Lander. He's a former referee uh, and now he's uh, an expert on uh, Mediano. But he says that uh, just say hi to him and thank him for always being exceptionally pleasant to meet both on the pitch and everywhere else. He is one of the nicest people I got to meet in my time as an uh, elite referee. So I just thought I wanted to give you that. Oh. Oh, thank you. You must have only talked to me after we won. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the last thing uh, for me, Aaron, because uh, it's right now no uh, no spectators in the in the stands um can we get you to to come back uh, for a game when uh, when the stadiums are, are full because i think uh, many fans i know that you're not uh in the spotlight uh, usually but uh, but i think many people will like to to say goodbye and uh, and thank you for for your time at the club can we get you to come back yeah of course um We are forever tied here. Um, you know, M Maria is Danish. Uh, Luca is, of course, has dual citizenship. Our daughter that's coming in, in August will have the same. We are forever tied um, to this country. You know, we will be back uh, every year. And of course, I I want so badly to uh, to be in the beer garden behind the south side. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. not have a task on a game day, but just walk around, see uh, what fun the fans are having, um, experience the game, of course, as a passionate fan and, and not as a coach. Um, and this is, this is never goodbye. This is, could very well be a, uh, a see you later. Uh, with every situation you try, there's, uh, there's always a, an opportunity that something doesn't work out or, It's a very good opportunity that um, you know, in years to come, we we are back here in, in one form or another. So I will, I, uh, in that sense, I feel that I'm forever tied to the club and I, I thank the fans, um, especially the ones that braved the cold and the shit uh, during the relegation years. Uh, you're waste. The away section was always full. Uh, did their absolute best to to carry the team, um, and just in general, everyone being so nice, so open. That's one of the best atmospheres I've I've seen in sport, um, and I I truly miss it. Uh, everybody does. Uh, and, uh, so that being said, I. I promise I will come back when, when the stadiums are full. I will be happy to uh, to see you on on Susan uh, Aaron. I want to uh, first of all thank you for uh, joining me in this interview, and then uh, you have a you have a little time left in 
in Bramby. Yes. And uh, it's good. Uh, the players handle it really well. We have a few massive games uh, before I go. And, uh, preparation's been good. Guys look good. Guys look fit. But two big ones. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, none of, uh, very, very little of this has been, uh, been about me. And the guys are just um, absolutely focused and ready to go. So, Great. yeah, need to be in that that top position going into the playoffs because I think, uh, yeah, they're rolling, man. The young boys, everybody looks good. Perfect, Aaron. That's uh, that's nice to hear. But uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much. All right, thank you. <laughs>